So welcome to all of you to our lecture number 15. Oh, here I have a, 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 an error. It says campus lecture. <laughs> it's a virtual lecture. Sorry for this. Um, the earth structure, uh, as we started discussing last time about seismically defined layers, we'll continue a bit with this. You remember about our discussion on the core and the mantle. And uh, we'll continue the discussion with the crust and rheologic layering. We'll see uh, what's different when we look from a rheological point of view. Uh, and we'll discuss about the lithosphere and asthenosphere. Um, and we'll end with the principle of, of isostasy. I don't know if you heard about this one, but you'll see what it is about. And it is like a, a background to some issues that are being discussed when we talk about the gravity field of the Earth um, in geophysics. But first, let's let's continue our discussion on what we started last time, the seismical defined layers. Um, and you remember we discussed about the core, the inner core, the liquid outer core, and about the mantle with uh, the upper mantle, the transition zone, the lower mantle. Very briefly, we discussed about this. And we are focusing now on the crust. So uh, as you can see here, we have this detail where, of course, we are talking about the, the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. So the lithosphere would, would include the, the crust and the very top of the mantle. Uh, but this is a discussion uh, that will continue. So first, let's finish with the crust itself. And if you remember, we discussed uh, in this context, we, we discussed about um, the continental crust uh, and the oceanic crust. Uh, and in the case of the continental crust, I was showing you that basically the largest uh, surfaces uh, of the continents are underlain by cratons, yeah, the nuclei of the continents, which are very old, more than 1 billion years. So the cratons, uh, could be exposed, and if they are exposed, we call that part a shield, like the Guyana shield, uh, to the east of Colombia. Uh, but the Guyana shield is part of the Amazon craton. And the parts that are uh, buried, that have on top of them sedimentary layers, we call them platforms uh, and or intracratonic basins. All right. Now, in addition to the cratons, today's continents have parts that are more recent. Um, and these parts would be the um, less than 1 billion year uh, old orogenic belts, rifts, which are zones of extension, and passive margins, I'll show you what they, they are, but which are a consequence of rifting as well. So let's go through these things. Uh, I think they are very interesting things and uh, see what they are. So the younger orogenic belts. Now, younger because younger than the cratons means neoproterozoic. So we, I will show you uh, in this part of the course, not today, I will show you the geologic time scale. Yes, uh, the part, <laughs> so I've seen the question. The part that is exposed of, a, of the craton that is exposed now at the surface is called the shield. Yeah. So, so basically, when you hear about the shield, you know that it is that part of the craton that you can access. Yeah. You have access to by walking on the ground. Uh, in and I gave you the example of the Guyana shield, which is part of the Amazon craton, and in North America, the Canadian shield. <laughs> yes, Gabriel, is part of the North American craton. And I will, sh you are welcome, Gabriel. You, I will show you in another class also the, uh, the situation for North America. Very interesting. Uh, we will discuss about, uh, I am going to dedicate two classes to Precambrian geology. I think it's very interesting, really very interesting Precambrian geology. It's fascinating and very, very um, challenging. Um, anyway, so. Many aspects in geology are fascinating. Now we are talking about the younger orogenic belts, which are 
starting from Neoproterozoic. What this means, when we talk about the geologic time, uh, you, you know about Phanerozoic, which started 570 million years ago, with the, with the, uh, its parts, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, and the, the subdivisions and so on. And you learned in paleontology and stratigraphy a lot about this part of uh, Earth's life. You probably didn't learn too much about the part that was before the Phanerozoic. And there are big eons there. Uh, and the last eon of the Precambrian is the Proterozoic, which has, is actually very long. It, it started in uh, 2.5 billion years ago and ended 5.7, um, 570 million years ago. So 0 0.57 billion years. So this is very long, 2 billion years, 2 billion years of the Earth's history. The Earth's history is 4.5, yeah? So 2 billion years is a Proterozoic. The Neoproterozoic started 1 billion years ago. All right, so what's younger? Yeah, we have orogenic belts. Uh, that were formed through the process of orogeny and that added were added to the cratons. So that's how the continents grow through addition through orogeny. So what happens, um, these orogenic belts, younger orogenic belts, um, they basically have a, a core of ignos and metamorphic rocks um, and structures that are younger than 1 billion years old. Now, what happens is, if you go to a young orogenic belt, you will find the rocks that were formed within the last billion years, but you'll also uh, find some older rocks, older rocks from uh, before Neoproterozoic, that were entrained in the process of orogeny and uh, basically could have been transformed severely and then you don't know that uh, because they were metamorphosed but some of them were preserved yeah however they could have been affected by structures as a result of deformation so the structures are younger the process of mountain building is the one that is younger all right what happens here in the case of the of the uh, young orogenic belts uh, and we call them young because relative to the history, the whole history of the earth, they are relatively young. Yeah. So their crust is thicker than that of the cratons. So in the case of the cratons, you are looking at 35, 40 kilometers. Here you have thicknesses of 65, 70 kilometers, like in the case of the Himalayan. And um, the, the active ones, the active ones are the Alps, uh, the Himalayas, and the Andes. Uh, these are uh, these are the orogenic belts where currently the process of orogeny continues. Now the, you have some that went through the process of orogeny; they are no longer uh, active, but they are still relatively young. Yeah, starting uh, they are from Paleozoic or uh, Neoproterozoic. And these ones would be like the Appalachians, Caledonites. In uh, South America, you'd have uh, um, what's called the Braziliano Pan African Orogens, um, and so on, in South America and Africa. Now, what happens when you have the mountain building, you have the topography being formed. And these are what we call the mountains that we like. We like to climb and go up and up and up. Once the process of orogeny ends, uh, other forces take over and the force of erosion. And basically an orogenic belt in let's say 100 million years would be eroded, uh, a lot of it. Yeah. So, so uh, in this case, in, in the case of the older orogenic belts uh, from this set that uh, is within the last one, 1 billion years, they no longer have the topography. So now, because of the erosion, you see the deeper levels of the origin. You see them now exposed. And the crust is no longer that thick as it is in the case of the active ones. You'll see why. 
we'll also have a, a classes on uh, the process of orogeny. So let's have a look at this map, at the, at the younger orogenic belts. So you can see here, uh, like these uh, white ones, these are the Mesozoic and Cenozoic, and you see the North American Cordillera and the Andes, yeah, Central America, the Andes. Um, also, what is basically uh, the Himalayas, you see them here, continuing through Turkey, with the Carpathians um, and uh, with the Alps. Um, so these are Mesozoic and Cenozoic, uh, the young ones. And you see uh, extensive zones here in uh, Indochina uh, that are young and in uh, the far east of Russia and so on. Now, what's Paleozoic? Uh, just a, a few famous examples. I mentioned the Appalachian origin. This is the Appalachian origin. So if you go to the United States, then if you go to the eastern part of the United States and you want to climb mountains, you go to the Appalachians. And uh, if you want to climb even, you know, uh, <laughs> higher mountains, you go to the western United States, to the western Cordillera. But the Appalachian is an orogenic belt. And what it, what it marks, this orogenic belt, it marks the closure of an ocean which was called the Iapetus Ocean, uh, which existed before before the Atlantic Ocean. We'll, we learned this in, in the case of the plate tectonics, because the, um, the, some origins basically record the closure of the oceans, yeah? like the Himalayas as well today. Um, and this Appalachian origin is part of the same orogenic belt that uh, today we call this segment the Caledonites. Uh, and the two segments, as you can see, they are separated by the, the current Atlantic Ocean, but they are actually the same origin when it was formed, which marks the closure of an older ocean pre-existing uh, before the Atlantic Ocean. That's uh, an, uh, another example of uh, Paleozoic orogenic belts. Um, these are the Urals in Russia. You see it's an orogenic belt going from north to south. And actually, geographically speaking, uh, it marks the boundary between Europe and Asia. Uh, Russia being the largest country in the world uh, in terms of uh, its uh, surface area, uh, it's, uh, it straddles both continents. So basically, it extends it has a European part and an Asian part, uh, and the Asian part is called Siberia. Um, so these are examples. Now, here in Australia, you have a, a Paleozoic orogenic belt. This is a New England orogenic belt, and here is another one called Lachlan orogen. So all these are Paleozoic, for instance. Uh, and if you were to look at, um, at Proterozoic, regions, of course, I was mentioning that in Brazil, you have some um, uh, Brazilian uh, um, uh, no proterozoic um, belts, for instance, and you see the terrains that were formed in, um, in uh, proterozoic, and some of them were in neoproterozoic. Um, all right, so this is in terms of the younger orogenic belts. If you have any questions, let me know. If not, we, we will uh, carry on. We'll discuss about orogeny and uh, origins in different classes. Now, when we talk about mountain building and uh, orogeny, we're talking about processes that lead to the thickening of the crust. So these are the, the processes of Compression. Yeah, we have compression regimes that lead to this. Um, now we have extension regimes as well, uh, and this is the case of the rifts. So imagine uh, a region, a continental region that undergoes extension. We'll discuss about the causes of extension, but imagine that it, it undergoes extension. So it is as if you pull apart. Yeah, you stretch basically. Uh, the lithosphere. And what happens here, uh, the, 
the thickness of the crust uh, in active uh, reefs could be only 25 kilometers. So you can compare that with the uh, active orogenic belts, 70 kilometers, 60 kilometers. So here the crust is thinner. And what happens in the process of rifting, if you look at these diagrams, um, imagine this is the initial uh, non-rifted uh, continental crust and the um, upper part of the mantle. So these two form the lithosphere. So what will happen when, when uh, the extension regime takes over? In the continental crust, you would have the formation of normal faults. These normal faults actually lead to the dropping of the of the surface and the the position of sediment. So basically, uh, sedimentary basins are are formed. Um, yes, da David, <laughs> you just uh, <laughs> you were a few seconds faster than I am. Uh, I was going to give as an example the eastern. Um, part of Africa, the uh, Eastern African Rift, which we will actually study uh, when we talk about the extension regime. So you will discuss about the um, this rift. So this is a typical example of a continental rift. And if, it, if the process of rifting were to continue, it would break apart completely the continental crust uh, and you would have the formation of um, oceanic crust, basically, and the initiation of a new ocean. And this is what's happening today in the Red Sea. We will, we will see these things, we will discuss them. So this is just theoretically so that you, you see that when we discussed about faults, when we discussed about how the matter behaves, how it, how it deforms in a brittle manner or in a plastic manner, we need to understand these things so that we can understand the structures that you are seeing in the crust uh, as a result of different tectonic regimes. So this is what happens. You can see the formation uh, of sedimentary basins. Also, you have volcanic activity. Now, what happens, as you can see, there is an upward be being formed, or the asthenosphere basically um, uh, rises up, the lithosphere is stretched. And what happens here is that as you rise, may, uh, uh, I think that most of you did not take the petrology course yet, but you will learn in petrology that one way of generating magma, that means melting the rock, is decompression. So the decrease of pressure. So the rocks are at a certain uh, temperature and pressure. In the, if the pressure uh, decreases, you can have partial melting. So partial melting happens with the de decompression as a result of the rising of the asthenosphere. So partial melting occurs and the melts penetrate the crust, first penetrate the, the upper mantle and then the crust. And there are processes of uh, differentiation. You will learn this in petrology differentiation and the evolution of magmas because the, ma the initial magmas can be ultramafic and mafic and then you have felsic ma magmas and that's why we have a granitic continental crust because you have this differentiation basically um, as the magmas go upper and upper and upper but this is a different discussion I was just going to tell you that this process of extension leads to magmatism and volcanism in the end. So um, in the end, uh, this simulation shows a 50 kilometer extension and the formation of this rift basin. Um, and as you can see, uh, basically, uh, once the rifting uh, stops, you would have also the erosion of the sides of the rift valley because what happens, the shoulders of the rift are uplifted during the rifting uh, you see there is an uplift that happens as well. But once this ends, there is erosion. So basically, to, uh, afterwards, uh, things become calmer in terms of topography. But in, in the case of the East African Rift, for instance, that's why you would see on the sides of the rift, you'd see this 
ranges, yeah, because they are the shoulders of the rift, which are uplifted. And there, there is um, a history I, uh, of rifting uh, during the uh, history of the Earth. And here, uh, sorry, this, I, this thing doesn't work very well, my mouse. Okay, I wanted to tell you that here, uh, in the Canadian Shield, you have, uh, you may have heard that in uh, Canada and the, uh, the border of the United States, you have five Great Lakes. Uh, the city of Toronto is on the uh, on the shore of uh, Lake Ontario. The city uh, of Cleveland in Ohio is on the shore of Lake Erie, and then you have Lake Huron and Michigan and on the shore of Lake Michigan in Chicago. But uh, the largest of these lakes, you know, I cannot show them to you because at this scale, you, you don't see the lakes, but uh, it's here. Uh, the largest of these lakes is Lake Superior. So La Lake Superior, which actually is a, the uh, most dangerous body of water on our planet in terms of navigation, <laughs> actually sits on top of a rift that occurred 1.1 billion years ago, and which almost broke the, uh, apart the uh, North American continent. N no one knows what stopped the evolution of this rift, but it almost led to the breakup and to the formation of a new oceanic basin. So the, there is a, a, a history of rifting, and uh, it's very interesting. We will, we will discuss about these things. Now, finally, the passive continental margins. Imagine, imagine that the breakup of the of the continent succeeds. Yeah, it is success, successful, and you break apart, and you have two two continental pieces, and in between you develop an ocean. So you have oceanic crust. So the margins of this of these uh, two pieces would be passive continental margins. Now, the reason they are called passive, we will learn when we talk about plate tectonics, that you can have active continental margins where you have the process of subduction. And we'll discuss this uh, in the next two classes, next week. But passive continental margin, imagine the stretching of the lithosphere to the point that you would no longer have continental crust and you develop oceanic crust, and then the margins of the two pieces are the margins of continents, and this is what the passive continental margins are. And um, here you have a thick, a thick package of sediment. Uh, they are called wedges of sediment. That uh, uh, these sediments come from the erosion of continents, uh, and then uh, in shallow waters you have reefs. So that's the idea. That's that's what forms the continental shelf. Continental shelf, as we discussed, is it's the extension of the continent under the surface of the water of the water. And initially you have these sediments, and underneath the sediments, uh, you you have the actual uh, crystalline crust. Um, and then you have the continental slope, which is basically the end of continental crust. So examples. The Atlantic Ocean on both sides has passive continental margins. There is no subduction in the Atlantic Ocean. So it can be the eastern shore of North America, the eastern shore of South America. Yeah, These are passive continental margins. Now, as you know, in some areas, these sedimentary layers host uh, oil and gas deposits. So you have all this industry uh, that um, exploits, search for, and exploits these um, these deposits on the continental shelves. All right. So now you have a, an idea of the major elements uh, of the continents. So what I want now to discuss is the base of the crust, because we are talking about seismically defined layers. So the moho which is the interface between the crust and the mantle, comes from the name of a Croatian 
geophysicist called Mohorovicic, who lived at the beginning of the 20th century. And he basically, that's why uh, he's honored, because he actually pointed out uh, from um, seismic um, records, yeah, from uh, seismic waves, pointed out the existence of this interface, uh, which marks the base of the crust. So it is a seismic discontinuity. That means that the P waves, yeah, primary waves, um, in the crust you've seen, uh, go up to six, seven kilometers per second. But the, the mantle, which is different in terms of petrology, it's ultra mafic, so below the moho, the velocities have a normally a sharp increase, a sharp increase to more than eight. So this is what moho shows. Basically, this change in the velocity of the uh, seismic waves, this change reflects a compositional boundary between the crust and the upper mantle. And um, as, I, as I was discussing, beneath the oceanic crust, it is a very distinct, very clear, very sharp uh, contact. Now, beneath con the continents, it varies. Uh, the, the moho is better defined in some areas, less well defined in other areas. So to, to show you uh, an example, and I think a very interesting example because I, I, I try to illustrate real life data, not only cartoons. This, what you are seeing here, is the radiography, if you want, of the crust of the North American Craton in Canada. So what Canada did, it put a lot of money into a big program that was called Lithoprobe. So this was a big program where they spent the money on carrying out seismic surveys that would basically investigate and obtain images of the crust in different parts of Canada. Now, Canada being such a large country, it has Creighton, it has young orogenic belt, so it has different environments, different tectonic environments. So they investigated this. So this is an image um, from um, the Superior Province, which is basically a, a, a large Archean Age province of the North American Creighton. Um, and what you see here basically is the radiography using seismic waves um, of the crust of a craton. So the moho, you can see basically the moho here, very distinct and very well. And here is not very well uh, defined. You see it's transparent. And here you can follow it. Now, this is what's called, and I'm anticipating you will take a seismic uh, exploration seismology course combined uh, I think in your fourth year, probably. As this is a reflection section. A reflection section is a section which is obtained by obtaining the, re the reflected energy from different interfaces. So the waves travel down and then they get reflected at different interfaces and travel up and we record the reflected energy. And this basically, through some processing, shows us a radiography of the crust. This method of reflection uh, is very much used, is 99% uh, of what is used in, in oil and gas exploration. So basically the geophysical companies that do oil and gas exploration, they use this method because it can image very well the structure of sedimentary basins. You can follow very nicely the interfaces between sedimentary layers and also the structures. It works not that well in the case of crystalline material like igneous and metamorphic rocks like here. So here, it's very hard to interpret for several reasons. 
uh, here very shallow, we might have boreholes and we know what the rocks are and what geological bodies we have. But beyond, let's say, two kilometers, we don't know. So it's anyone's guess what we have there because you cannot get there. So the, the idea is that there is a lot of discussion, speculation, what this type of reflectivity is. It is believed that in the middle and lower crust, you have primarily, you have gneisses, which is a metamorphic rock, which has gneissic bending. You remember we, when we discussed about uh, structures, I was uh, showing you how gneissic bending or compositional bending is formed in the case of gneisses. So it is believed that this reflectivity, this strong reflectivity, reflects this in some instances. In other instances, you can have intrusions of mafic material that forms bodies called seals. They are horizontal, like, like sheets. Uh, the is with strong uh, contrasts in physical properties. That means the, the velocity of the seismic waves and the density. And that's why you would see these interfaces. But uh, there are also areas that are more transparent. We don't know why they are more transparent. We know that you have, if you have big plutons, like let's say a granitic pluton, they tend to be transparent because they don't have internal layering or interfaces. So maybe here, you see here, for instance, we might have a pluton. Like this, for instance, is a pluton at the surface. So here we might have uh, a Pluton, but it's not that easy to interpret this type of sections. However, I hope that you find them interesting and this kind of um, triggers new interests uh, for you. There is a lot for us to understand when it comes to the structure uh, and the geology of the crust. So many things you can do in, in your career if you are interested in them. Anyway. So you see the Moho be below the North American continent. Uh, one question is, what is this? It could be a shear zone. There are some people would, uh, I will show you when we discuss about Precambrian ge geology. I will show you what some people interpret as being old Archean age subduction zones using this type of uh, data. All right, so this is it in terms of our discussion in general about the continental crust. So we are done with the seismic layering. And now what we'll discuss, we'll discuss a bit, a bit about the rheologic layering. So rheologic, you remember rheology refers to the capacity of materials to flow. <laughs> so this actually uh, leads to the concepts of lithosphere and asteronosphere. So, the observations first. The observations are that you have the regions of higher elevations, like the mountain ranges, they have thicker crust, like here. And where you have smaller elevation, you have thinner crust, and you can see this. All right, so this is one, one observation, for instance. Another one, which is very interesting, and you might have heard about it, or if, if not, it's the first time you might hear, what happens is that imagine the continental ice sheets. Today, we have continental ice sheets in Greenland. So Greenland, it's a big island. Yeah? It's the largest island next to the North American continent, geologically linked to the North American continent. But Greenland, because of the climate conditions, it has a big sheet of ice that sits on top of it. And in Greenland, to, if you want to see the rocks, you, you can go only along the margins of Greenland. Inside, it's just this field of ice. Now, the second part on our planet where you have a continental ice sheet is Antarctica, the continent of Antarctica, that again, it is basically, it has because the, it, it sits at the pole, and the climate is such 
that the water, the, the temperature is below freezing. So it has a thick sheet of ice sitting on top of this continent. And also only on the margins, you have a bit of the geology exposed. What happens is these continental ice sheets press down, uh, they, they push on the crust and basically press down on what we call the lithosphere. Now imagine that the climate changes and also the continents move. So what happens is we had periods of glaciation like here. Imagine you had glaciation and you had continental ice sheets covering the northern part of Europe, like the Scandinavian countries like Norway, Sweden, Finland, Russia, being covered by ice. And also today's Canada being covered by, by ice, by these big continental ice sheets. And what happens, the glaciation ended, the climate changed, the continental ice sheets uh, uh, melted. And now the, the observation is that there are regions that suffer an increase in, that, that rise up, an increase in elevation. So these regions rise up. So in, in the uh, Baltic region, you have this, this uh, continuous, yeah, continuous rising and also in Hudson Bay in Canada. So the idea is, why is this? Well, the reason is because basically the lithosphere acted as an elastic sheet. So it was loaded, so it was depressed. And when the load was removed, it tries to recover, All right? So this is what happens. But initially people didn't know this. So they, they, they had these observations and they realized by, with these observations, they realized that there is a, the upper part of the planet that behaves as an elastic sheet. And this is what we call the lithosphere. So the lithosphere, basically, when you compare seismic layering and the rheologic layering, the lithosphere, is this part that behaves in a rigid manner. And it contains the crust and a part of the upper mantle. Yeah, so, so crust plus a part of the upper mantle. And below it, there is a region that we call a stenosphere. And it behaves in a plastic manner. Yeah, it flows. It's not liquid, but we, we discussed about this aspect. So it flows. So at large scale, at a large scale, you have a shell that behaves, mechanically speaking, as a rigid cover, as a rigid, uh, a rigid cover. And below you have something that yields, that basically deforms in time in a plastic manner and accommodates the bending of this rigid shell. So this is the idea of rheologic layering. So if you compare this, you'd see that what we have the crust and uh, the mantle here, uh, and we have defined this in terms of seismic layers. You see here, we can define it in a rigid part, which is a lithosphere, and the plastic part, which is the rest of the mantle. And in terms of the, of the core, we already discussed part of it, the outer core is liquid and the inner part is solid and probably plastic, but you see a question mark. I mean, we don't know very well, but we assume it is given the temperatures and all this. All right, so a bit about each of, each of them. As I was just saying, rheologically, you talk about the lithosphere and you have the crust and the uppermost part of the mantle. And this part of the mantle is called the lithospheric mantle because it's part of the lithosphere. And on geologic time scales, yeah, as we have ice sheets and they melt, you place a load. And what happens, because it's rigid, the lithosphere has a certain flexural rigidity. That means 
that it can support a certain load without bending. Flexural rigidity is resistance to bending. But if the load becomes too, too big, then it bends. Yeah, it bends. That's the idea. Now, the cratons, the lithosphere in the case of cratons, it's very thick. It's very thick. And it has great flexural rigidity. So basically, they can support the load. Younger parts of the crust, they are younger, warmer, they have lower flexural rigidity. Now, what's interesting, and this is another aspect in general speaking about geology, is that in the case of the cratons, which have very thick, very thick lithosphere, going down to more than 150 kilometers, can go down to 250, for instance. In those very deep parts of the lithosphere, there you have the conditions for the formation of diamonds. Diamonds, in terms of chemical formula, is just carbon. So if you have graphite and diamond, they are the same in terms of chemistry. They are just different in terms of the crystalline structure because the graphite is hexagonal yeah, and the atoms are in these uh, sheets with hexagonal symmetry and the graphite is very weak, whereas the diamond has a cubic structure and it's the strongest material, but the same chemical composition. Now you have a stability field for graphite and for diamond, and that stability field is at high pressure. So the idea is that you have the conditions for the formation of diamonds only, only in the, at the depth in the roots of the cratons, the lithospheric roots of the cratons. And what happens is you have a special type of magmatism called kimberlitic magmatism, very rare, that forms uh, basically, uh, that forms uh, melts here in the, in the deeper part of the lithospheres. And when the, the melts rise, they trap and entrain the diamonds and bring them to the surface. And that's how we have deposits of diamonds. And that's why they are so rare, so expensive, of course. So just for you to know that there is something very special about the cratons. In general, they are extremely rich in uh, different, different minerals. All right. So when we talk about lithosphere and asthenosphere, and we talk about them behaving differently rheologically, that means they behave in a physical, in a mechanical way differently. But compositionally, that means if you are here or here, the composition is not different. It's not like being here in the crust and then in the mantle. Here, this is a compositional boundary and also a contrast in physical properties. Here, the definition of this boundary is basically this isotherm. So this is the surface where the temperature gets to 1280, 1280 degrees Celsius. So this isotherm defines the boundary between what we call the lithospheric mantle and the asthenosphere. What happens, it is believed that at this temperature, the principal mineral of the mantle, which is olivine, uh, becomes weak and behaves in a, in a plastic manner. You see, uh, dislocation creep is the deformation mechanism. So remember, the boundary between the lithosphere and the asthenosphere is actually a thermal boundary. Yeah, it's not a compositional boundary. And the other interesting aspect is the temperature can change, yeah, because uh, because it depends on many factors, it depends on the dynamics and uh, tectonics and what happens. And is that with time also you have cooling, so so this boundary can migrate. That's why that's why now you understand why in the case of the cratons 
the lithosphere is so thick because they are old and cold. So the boundary migrated. And in the case of the young, uh, young part of the continents, <laughs> uh, the, they are warmer and then the boundary is basically shallower. So the thermal boundary. So this is, I would say, very interesting aspect. Um, now, speaking from the point of view of the asthenosphere, yeah? so you see, if you load the lithosphere, you see, uh, if you had an experiment and this were honey as a fluid, the, the mantle is not a fluid, yeah? the asthenospheric mantle is not a fluid, but it behaves over long periods of time, geologic time, it behaves as if it is a fluid because it flows yeah, through dislocation creep, through plastic deformation. So what you have to remember about the asthenosphere is that it is plastic yeah, over long periods of time, geologic time, not on very short time scales. Seismic waves go through it because it is solid material. It is not a liquid. So on very short period of, of time, basically it's elastic, but this is, you know, uh, or, on very short period of times. But on long periods of time, it flows. Imagine you take a block of ice. Yeah, you know that the ice with time flows. Yeah, that's what glaciers do. They flow. But if you take a hammer and uh, smash it into the ice, you'd break the ice. So on a very short uh, time scale, the ice will behave differently. Yeah, that's the idea. It's the same with the asthenospheric mantle. All right, so if we didn't have the, the, the lithosphere as, as this cap, which is rigid, then loads would basically sink into the asteroid mantle. And this is what it is believed that happens with the oceanic uh, lithosphere when it subducts and sinks into the asteroid mantle in time. So we'll talk about plate tectonics. But that's our understanding, yeah? And that because you understand the mechanics of it, we, we see why it is possible to have this. All right. So you might ask me, what's uh, the uh, lower boundary of, of what we call asthenosphere? And there is no consensus here because some people would say, well, it's the top of the transition zone, top of the lower mantle, the lower boundary of the mantle, because the mantle is plastic. So the idea is we know how it behaves right under the lithosphere. Now, how it behaves farther down, is it really different or not? So you remember I told you about the debate on whether you have convection currents in the mantle and if, if, if you have cells separated in the upper mantle and the lower mantle or in the whole mantle and so on. So it, it relates to that debate, all right? So this is in terms of our stenosphere. Now. Let's see how much time we have. We have about three, um, three more slides, and I'm going to introduce to you uh, the concept of isostasy. Um, this is not an easy concept to introduce, um, but I'll, I'll start with a story. Uh, in the 18th century, there, were, uh, there was an expedition which was led by Pierre Bouguet here in South America. Uh, and his name, Bouguet, is used for to designate um, the result of processing of gravity data. So when you go and measure gravity data, in order to be able to interpret it geologically, you have to obtain a map with the Bouguet anomaly. So when you when we will study geophysics, you'll learn about this. But then Bouguet comes from the name of this gentleman the scientist. So what they did, they went to Peru and they were very interested in measuring gravity and so on. So what they were thinking, they were saying, well, the mass of the mountains of the Andes must have also must, if you have a plumb line, a plumb line, imagine, uh, you know, you have a thread and at the end you have a weight. And in the past, the weight would be lead. Yeah, plumb. 
So basically, you have it, and uh, the line. Uh, this uh, this is vertical because this is the attraction, yeah, the gravitational attraction. But what Bouguer was thinking was thinking well. If you have big mountains like the Andes, there would be a little attraction of this mass of the mountains, yeah, lateral attraction because they are mass, and any mass would attract another mass. That's <laughs> um, that's a, a law of nature. So the idea is that they went to Peru and they started doing these measurements and they were expecting a certain de deviation, yeah. a certain deviation uh, like this of the of the plumb line of the weight. And they didn't get it. It was less than what they were expecting. Then in the following century, there was this gentleman, so George Everest and the name Everest, uh, his name was given to the highest mountain, uh, highest peak. Um, he did similar measurements in the Himalayas. And again, he repeated uh, the result. Basically, the expectation was not fulfilled. The, the, the weight was attracted less than, uh, than they were expecting given the mass. They calculated the mass of the mountains, the, the, the mountains that you have above you know the zero level so what was the cause for this so in the 20 in, in the 19th century there was this debate uh, between these two gentlemen who independently published in 1855 actually <laughs> uh, pratt published i think in december 8, 1854 but does matter so they published two papers trying to explain this phenomenon. And uh, both gentlemen were uh, Englishmen. Now, Pratt was, uh, uh, I think he was a chaplain or an assistant to the Bishop of uh, um, Kolkata, Calcutta in, uh, in the English term in India. And Airy, uh, so Pratt was a mathematician, but he was also serving his religious duties. And Airy was a professor at Cambridge. And they both tried to explain this um, observation and why the expectation was not fulfilled. And they offered two different hypotheses. And the two different hypotheses, you can see them uh, in these diagrams. Pratt said, well, actually, the mountain range is less dense than the rest of the crust. And basically, uh, all, the, all the crust sits at the same level, uh, like here, on top of the mantle. That's what, that's what Pratt was suggesting. And basically, uh, both Bouguet and Everest, they didn't know that because this is lower density, the plumb line, the weight, was attracted less than they thought. So this is what Pratt said. So he said, the blocks of the crust, there is a, a level of compensation. And they all, let's say, float on top of the mantle at the same level because they have different densities. And the level of compensation is flat. Avery, the mathematician from Cambridge, what he said, he said, no, no, no. We have more or less the same density of the crust, the yeah, average density. So the problem was that the plumb line here was attracted less by the mountain range because you have a root that goes into the mantle. You have a root of the mountain range, which is less dense because this is crust and this is mantle, which is less dense than mantle material. So the expectation was that Bouguet and uh, Everest, they didn't know about the effect, the gravitational effect of this less dense root. And that's why the plumb line was not attracted this much. So as you can see, we have two competing visions. And the question is, where do we have the level of compensation. What is the reality? Is this like this, 
or is it like this? Now, you remember that we talked about the mountain ranges being thicker. So this already tells us that the air, airy hypothesis is closer to, to the reality than the Pratt hypothesis. So the concept of isostatic compensation refers to this fact that the large topographic features are compensated at depth by mirror-like topographic features at the base of the crust or the base of the lithosphere. Now, at the time of Airy and Pratt, they were discussing about the crust. They didn't have the concept of lithosphere. Nowadays, we talk about compensation below the base of the lithosphere, compensation somewhere in the asthenosphere. But you know what happens to the icebergs, yeah, the icebergs. So the icebergs, like the famous situation with the Titanic that hit one of these, is that a bit of them is above the water and there is a big part of them under the water. Yeah. So the idea is that the airy view, you can, in, in the airy view, you can take this C as a level of compensation and the pressure here equals the pressure here. So the, the column here, the weight of the column here, you see it adds these three, these two layers, basically the mantle and the oceanic crust. Whereas here you have the topography of the mountain, which is on top of this uh, part of the crust here. So you see below the oceans, the mantle approaches the surface. And that's why the oceanic crust and lithosphere are thinner and the continental lithosphere is thicker. Now, in reality, in reality, the model is not perfect in the case of Airy. And the reason is because the lithosphere is a rigid layer. So basically the compensation is not right only under the mountains. It is more regional, yeah? Because you have to bend these. So imagine this situation. And Venning Mines, Venning Mines, Felix Alexander Venning Mines, he was a Dutch, yeah? He was from Holland. And basically he, this is, the um, model he offered, which is closer to reality, that the compensation is regional. You have the, the loading of an uh, orogenic belt here, but the compensation will not happen just locally, as Airy thought. It would happen regionally. So if we can manage to image the base of the crust and the base of the lithosphere, we would see a more regional bending, not just under the mountain. That's the idea. All right, so finally, this leads us to, to the principle of isostasy. It says when you, know, when you can have this uh, vertical movement yeah, beyond the flexural rigidity, the lithosphere would sit at an appropriate level in the asthenosphere so that, that there is a depth of compensation where the pressure is the same. Now, this is ideally speaking. Yeah. When this condition is met, then it's said that the lithosphere is, is isostatically compensated or in isostatic equilibrium. So think about this. I'll show you, I'll, I'll return to this little model. Imagine the process of mountain building. So the mountain building occurs and there is also a regional compensation. So you get this lithospheric route under the, the Andes, under the Himalayas, and so on. Now, the process of mountain building stops and the mount, mountain edifice is eroded and removed. What would happen? Normally with time, normally with time, there is a recovery. So the root, the lithospheric root, will start to recover yeah? because there is the flow, the, the, the pressure is no longer the same. 
So it's a state of disequilibrium. It's no longer equilibrium. So with time, this will flow. So this is why when you look in the case of the old mountain belts that are no longer active, and you, you may ask me, why in that case we don't see so thick roots as in the case of the Himalayas or the Andes? Because of this re, uh, reason, because of the fact that over long periods of time, there is this adjustment and the tendency towards isostatic equilibrium. All these aspects that we discussed about isostasy are important in understanding the gravity data. When we do gravity measurements along, uh, across the continents, this is very important because the existence of these roots, we can basically see it in the gravity data because there is a big mass, a big volume of mass that is less dense than the surrounding mass. And then you'd have over continents in general, you would have negative regional negative gravity anomalies due to the presence of these lithospheric roots. All right, so this is it. I will let you read about this in the textbook as well. Uh, read please these uh, pages as a continuation of what we started last time. If you have questions, please uh, don't feel shy. Um, and I'll see you on Tuesday and uh, have a, yeah, you are welcome, David. A good uh, fin de semana. And, uh, enjoy, and uh, well, I'll see you next week. We'll discuss very interesting things as well. Uh, you are welcome, all of you. I can see your messages. Thank you for them. Um, <laughs> so, uh, bye to all of you if you don't have questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, teacher. Thank you, teacher. Bye. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, all of you. You're welcome.